per megawatt to produce about two tons of uranium and plutonium and about 2,000 tons of sodium works at a high temperature, high neutron. It's a challenge. Every component, every sensor you to take, it's a challenge. And many a times it has not been done to that alacrity and that reliability level like what today regulators would accept. So this, we had to take a challenge. We took a challenge involving almost 100 educational institutes and 500 industries to do this challenge. I would not go through the list, but sodium has its challenge, plutonium has its challenge. Sodium opacity provides a challenge. Meeting the seismic conditions is a challenge. The in-service inspection is the problem. Life limiting is very tough because sodium takes away the heat very fast. So you have huge amount of stresses, both creep and fatigue coming on the material, which makes the design to be very difficult. And we had to do the design. And we know India is not very good in design. India, even for very, very normal engineering components, as I said, for windmill, takes the design. For most of the things which we see around, even my specs, the design is not Indian. So I think uh, Indians to do the design of this kind of a things is a tough job. And when we had taken PHWR earlier, the design take from Canada and we improved upon it. We made innovations to become competitive. I'm showing here one example, the nine chromium oxide dispersion steels. We again brought Professor Indranal Minna is a very much a part of this. Uh, in fact, I still remember discussing on a journey from Calcutta to Kharagpur, the challenge of oxide dispersion steels. We brought academia research and industry, and from concept to delivery, we delivered the product which is now in the reactor. And when I talked in a Japanese forum, they said, how much money you spent and how many people are involved? Because they are working on it for almost 15 years. And we worked for two years with our best of the people, and I think we spent hardly anything worth mentioning. This is, again, the synergy. I think we have to realize that only synergy would allow us to do the individual eminence would bring great biodatas, but the synergy of the organizations would help the country, and we must follow that. Then there's another challenge that you bring 10 companies, because each component is made by a separate company, and the way the fast reactors work, it is very, very close tolerances, and you have to see that everything is all right. Now, 10 companies to work in a space of 12 meter and realize a system in three months to four months is a bigger challenge than any other science and technology challenge I have. So this today international platform, everybody recognize that we are, if not the world leader, we are among the world leader. Many countries, we call us the world leader, but I think we should wait till the reactor goes critical, gets commissioned, and then we have full power coming out of it, and we put four more reactors. But I think we have really used state-of-art concept we had wonderful collaborations. Going from pressurized water reactors to fast reactors, now we have thorium utilization reactors, and we are an equal partner in the fusion reactors. India is one of the very few countries who is an equal partner, and we are a leader. We are not partnering with money only. I think in all the aspects where we are in the ITER, we are on the basis of science and technology. Again, I'm giving some examples where how you have to manage a synergy of many things. So you have to pick up the experts in each area, be a academician, researcher, or a technologist. Somebody, a leader, has to really vet it all through empirical or analytical models and say that we are advancing. And this remains the most difficult area of development. My pride really came when the most critical component, the cryostat for the fusion reactor, which is being built in France, it was a global bid. And all the countries in the world wanted to do this component because in addition to money, this is a pride. And who backed this order? Larson and Tupro of India. Most competitive global company. And what was the basis? They had to only say that they have made the reactor vessel of hospital reactor. This is the same material, same tolerance. And we have the people, we have the machinery. And no other country had done the reactor of that size in the world. And Larson and Tupro walked away with this order. I think we can be globally competitive if we build, the, build our expertise with the baby steps, but finally maturing to a very large, potent uh, capability. Just about one year back, there was a view as to how we take the ITER, which is experimental reactor, to a commercial reactor, to a demo reactor. 
This was the World Committee, which was set up by European Commission. And we were all debating. At that time, our experience of the fast reactor was a vital issue. And that was perhaps the reason why I was a part of that committee. And we very clearly gave a guideline that how we would progress from the experience of experimental reactors to the ITER to the demo reactors. And we use the approach which we have used very consistently in IJCAR, that means baseline material, risk materials, continuously compare with the peer review and change our plans if needed, otherwise go on increasing the depth. This is one example which I have taken from Steve Zinkel, but why I have taken is that our great friend R. Vishwanathan, most of the metallurgists who work on steels would realize his very large contributions, that how with the modeling, simulation, knowledge of the chemistry of the materials and microstructures, you can raise the temperature of a same material by large measure. That means the costs come down, the performance goes up, and you have altogether a new paradigm. This was again an inspiration when the issue came that we are going to be dependent on coal, and how we can use the coal much better. Say 10% more efficiency rather than 40% uh, thermal efficiency. Can we work at 50% efficiency? So at that time, I worked out a strategy. It was discussed with Shyam Saran, who was very close to the Prime Minister at that time. Dr. Chidambaram was our patron. We sort of discussed all the issues. And we very clearly demonstrated that we know most of the technology. It is only a few components and few materials if we master we can have the efficiency 10% more. And if 10% more thermal efficiency, that much coal is less burned, and about 20% less in the CO2 emission would happen. So we started a national program. Corrosion mitigation was a problem. And we drew a plan. We said that IGCAR on research and development, Medani and NFC for providing various components. At a first level, national and international labs and bring BHEL, because they are the power equipment manufacturer. Bring the NTPC and then wet them together. So with Dr. Chidambaram in the lead, we had MOU and Synergy where all these three organizations joined together. We build a network. We want to be the first country in the world who would realize the advanced super thermal critical plant. So today, just like I'm talking about fast reactors and fusion reactors, I believe it is realizable. Because it's a Synergy, and it is taking good shape. The Synergy is accepted. We have learned a great lesson from gas turbine, how year to year we go on in challenging the temperature range and the maintenance-free life of the gas turbines. All the aeroplanes which we fly are the gas turbines. And this now again has become an inspiration for HEL, GTRE, and one more organization, I think. They are joining together hands that the land gas turbines would be indigenously made rather than being imported. So I think we are learning. It is not that we are not learning. We are learning how to knit our expertise together and how to bring everybody together. So you do one technology, you spend a lot of money on R&D. Next time, your R&D requirement is very less. Why our decisions are becoming difficult as compared to many advanced countries is we are still building our foundation and critical groups. So we need a large amount of money to deliver the technology. Whereas if I'm in the West or USA, I can utilize and network those things and be able to do it. That's where we have to really take a case with the policymakers and ask them to invest large money in our R&D, and not a subcritical money. We do good science, but we will not be able to deliver the technology. So this I say that the Indian energy crisis is not entirely inevitable. If you look at our resources, with plenty of possibilities of nuclear, solar, and wind, I think we can meet it very well, and we can make a transition to the low-carbon energy economy much easier and better, because they are already having assets. Their new energy additions are very little. We are adding new energy. So I think we can make the changes very easily. And many innovations are happening, which if we take those ideas to the technology, we would be the leaders. This I took from, uh, I think, just about four days, five days, as I was very much interested. They have taken inspiration from Sunflower, and uh, they say that the efficiency of this configuration can be increased, and combined with the solar, thermal, the air conditioning, heating requirement, all that, this is a, can become a grand design of a smart city to be able to use this kind of a concept. 
We were doing a report on the wind energy, and there are a whole lot of issues which need to be addressed, right from now with the satellite technology, we have uh, the wind profiling, which is available, which helps us to design small turbines to big turbines, the foundation onshore and offshore. But I don't think we have, like in other areas where I talked about that we can do the synergy, here we'd have to think about a synergy of a different kind if you are going to put 100,000 or 150,000 megawatt of wind energy, I think we have to have a synergy. I still don't know. We have prepared a report which was to be given to the Planning Commission. The report is ready. We are looking at a new structure to come. We involved all the players, and then we hope that we'd have to change the paradigm shift. The combination of the the combination of the solar and the batteries is again becoming extremely important to be able to provide sustainable energy to the small communities. And I think this is taking shape. This is in various, maybe you would say, level two kind of stage in the technology where the science is very exciting and technology has to be done. So these innovations have to be grown. Just the excitement of these things is not going to really help us. Similarly, all liquid battery, it's not Indian work, but uh, all liquid metal batteries, again, a concept where the life can be increased, cost can be brought down. And I think a few days back, I read the titanium oxide electrode in the fuel cells would make the electrical cars to be going for much longer distances as compared to others. This, again, if you look at uh, the gas turbine, I gave the example that how gas turbine every year made a difference. And today, we have very, very high temperature almost touching to the melting point of a metal where we use the materials. Similarly, in the thermoelectric materials, bringing the super lattices into the account, I think made a tremendous difference in the efficiency of thermoelectric material. And today you can look at the school science where you can enhance the conductivity by putting some atoms and also breaking the flow of the thermal conduction and you can enhance the thermoelectric material. Innovations are taking more than science in this material, and there are components and the equipment which are coming. And this is extremely important because on the average, our extraction of the heat from electricity is 30% on the average. 70% is waste. Thermoelectric is a great potential to use. If not 70%, even, let us say, 20 30% of that we can use. We don't have to put additional energy resources. It's a great message in energy efficiency. Here again, I draw from my own work and my colleagues' work, my students, that where with the nanofluids, Professor Indranil Manna is one of the pioneers in this area, how we can increase the conduction and make the future machines much more better, how with the MEMS and NEMS we can do a whole lot of robotics and sensors, which I define, how the coefficient of friction can be brought almost to be zero. We don't want zero, near zero. And this work we demonstrated that by the combination of titanium carbide and amorphous carbon hydrogen, we are able to bring the coefficient very small. And how the bio, which we consider as fouling, corrosion, we can make it as very protective and very useful to us. After all, nature does it all the time, how we can do it. So these are the directions which now I'm pursuing with some of my students under J.C. Bose Fellowship, and we hope that would be able to provide some paradigm changes. Again, I brought that why we are not able to take science to the society. Everybody says good science must go to the society. But if you even have a very cursory look at a slide like this, it is very complex. It has many factors. And unless we have the teams which where all the specialists are there, it is very difficult for us to do it. And we need to learn synergy. We need to learn to challenge the envelopes of the technology, and unless we do that, and we have in very few areas this, and wherever we have, either in space or atomic energy or missile program, or you name a few other industries, software, I think we, biotechnology now it is taking up. I think wherever we have established a good synergy, we are making progress better than that. Another problem is that you have giga tons of materials for billions of people, and they are not recycled. Unless we recycle, we would not be able to sustain this planet. And as of the current estimates, only 4% of the material flow is recycled. You can imagine 
how the modern society has had huge appetite for everything, including materials, but it has not given thought to sustainability. And it is not, again, that much a challenge. It requires good science, technology, and policies. And I think this is something which has been totally ignored. We have not even started giving thought to it in a broader way, though very sporadic efforts are there. So what's the way forward? I think most important thing for us is to have energy foresight, which is done by think tanks and which is accepted by the country. And we go on revisiting it a few years, but we don't have energy foresight. We discuss a few times and carry forward certain recommendations out of that. Second is like in our space and atomic energy, dissection of challenges and then synergy to achieve targets. There can be thousands and thousands of people working on one challenge, but then we must have a synergy. We don't have that. We must have a synergy to achieve targets. Science and technology for policy and policies for science and technology related to energy challenge of India. We see in the newspaper, media, in our meetings that our policies are very fragmented and so is our science and technology. R&D with the purpose of competitive advantage. R&D not for the sake of research only. Finance, this must be assured in the hands of leaders like, like what we did in our early years. Early years foundation is becoming very handy now and but we must assure the finance and resources not they have to struggle every time and the track record of individual is not respected, though the person has done a tremendous amount of work. And where a calendar date come, and then you ask the person to go, and then say you are no longer a part of the dream India. I think that way we cannot build the country. Very few people would be able to do it. Human resources and skill developments, scale and pace of achievements. In energy especially, we have failed in the scale and pace of achievements, and we have to find a mantra for that. Affordability, I mentioned, how much for each one, how much for GDP growth, how much for equity, all that has to be done. There are always spin-offs, and going by Homi Baba, the spin-offs are sometimes more valuable than what you did for your assignment. We did a super quantum brain uh, neural measuring system all indigenously. The concept behind was that most of the medical diagnostic equipments are imported today. We were of the view that uh, if we can do such a system indigenously, then we can challenge the community and say that it is accepted by your own surgeons, physicians, specialists, and uh, neuro people. If we can do that, we can do other medical instruments also. I'm delighted Dr. C.S. Sundar, who along with Dr. T.S. Radhakrishnan really steered it. We developed a state of art system. The people, the doctors who wanted to use, they're very happy with this. And then we demonstrated also that some unique deficiencies in the human system can be detected with the help of this. And this has a number of applications actually for the mineral prospecting, for submarine detection, water prospecting, and a whole lot of things. So again, if you challenge really a new horizon and take a challenge, I think there are people who can do it. This I came across recently, and it was very fascinating for me. It was all experience which we make, but somebody puts it in a very nice way and you feel this is a good way of communication. There is a pure basic research, this fellow says, Donald Stokes, like Bohr. Use inspired basic research like Pasteur. Pure applied research like Edison. But we have to find that are we in one of these boxes? Fair enough, we can do whatever we want. Am I in the unnamed box? I think the danger is if I'm in the unnamed box, all my life is gone with no production. So many of us, if we really consider how much of our work and effort is in the unnamed box, I think we realize that we need a very different approach to doing science. I lived in Kalpakam, so I start strongly believe that science, art, literature, philosophy, that place is so rich. Some of you who have not visited must visit not only Kalpakam, but Mahabalipuram, Marvile, and all that. I think it's a great place, and this again something from my experience, I found that whatever I see every day, I see in the press, media, echoes, noise, politicians, bureaucrats, economists, wherever I go, I see them. Whatever space is left, I find the business and public is there, maddening uh, sort of speech, maddening discussions in the Times Now and other channels, and uh, maddening noise and uh, sort of a business people getting a sort of a visibility 
Where are the academicians, philosophers, who are supposed to steer this vehicle? Where is their voice? Are we to blame or somebody else is to be blamed that the society doesn't have a steering wheel or has a steering wheel which is inadequate to be able to do it? I don't have the answer. But I believe without the academic and ethics steering wheel, I think we have a difficult to manage our problem. And finally, I think you can talk about many things for a developing nation, emerging nation, resurgent India, aspiring India. You need a mindset. The people who achieved in this country or anywhere, I think uppermost was mindset, not their backgrounds, not what degrees they have. They had the degrees or not the degrees. It's the mindset. Are we creating people in this country with a mindset to serve the country and solve the challenges? I believe we are. Because even if not in my generation and next generation, I think next to next generation is incredible. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that extremely informative lecture. I would now uh, request Professor Indranil Manna, the director, to please uh, 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 felicitate Professor uh, Dr. Raj uh, with a memento and a shawl. Thank you, sirs. So IIT Kanpur takes great pride in the activities of our students, whether academic activities in class or extracurricular activities outside, ranging from da dance, dramatics, and sports to uh, robotics and photography. To provide a glimpse of the wide talent that students of this institute have, we will now have students from the Culture Council of the Student Gymkhana performing for us. Uh, please put your hands together for a music performance.
दशते तन
Sitaram. Uh, but before we move on to the vote of thanks in the lunch, uh, I request all present to kindly rise for the national anthem. Uh, yeah, please introduce yourself. Hello. Yeah. Uh, we are the music club IIT Kanpur. Uh, on the keyboard, we have Shambhavi, myself, myself, Legend George. Uh, this is Deepika, Rahul, Anupa, Mukul, Shubham, Rahi, Paridhi, and Archit. Before the national anthem, I, I request Professor Munshi, uh, the Dean of Resources and Alumni, to give the vote of thanks. Uh, it's a difficult job, but I'd like to make it quick. Uh, First, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Baldev Raj, who I know for many, many years and in many different countries. Least I had the personal uh, honor to meet him. Uh, I'm very happy that he could find time on this very important day. He had a very illustrious career. I remember he once told me how he started off in BARC training school and went to Kalpakam and nobody dared to go in that part of the country and he set up the first NDT group. And nobody knew NDT, and I would like to share, take a few seconds, that I started this course, NDT, in IIT Kanpur, uh, looking up to the Kalpakam group, and uh, it's quite uh, popular among the students. So thank you, Dr. Baldev Raj. Uh, then, of course, I can't, uh, uh, I mean, I have very few words to say. I have a lot of words to say, but very, very shortly, Professor Anand Krishnan, who has been uh, the teacher from my batch, and then he was teaching civil engineering when I was here, and we fondly remember his book, the TA-101, Engineering Graphics. We, of course, have <coughs> the three distinguished institute fellows, uh, Professor Satyamurti, whom I have known for many, many years, and my teacher, Professor Ramon Rao, who taught me Henderson and Quant, and I suppose I speak on behalf of Didi also. Uh, and of course, uh, Professor Thande, who is not here. And then I switch my thanks to the second part of the function. Uh, the Alumni Association is Professor Venkatesh here. Yeah, the secretary, Professor Venkatesh, is there who worked out all the details for the Distinguished Alumnus Awards. And Professor Raji Gupta, who is the treasurer for Alumni Association, and Mrs. Lalita, who worked very hard to come up with this part of the function. And uh, I want to say a little thing about Didi, because everybody says Didi and Mrs. Didi, but Mrs. Didi actually is an alumni, and I like to repeat it here. Abha is my batchmate. So thank you, Abha, for coming here and taking the time out. And she is a proper alumni I call electrical engineering and not a physicist. <laughs> That's the lighter side of life. Uh, then, of course, in the end, I have to thank uh, my boss, Professor Indalil Manna, who always says yes to most of the things we want. And of course, we can't forget Dr. Sachan, who is a registrar, and my uh, friend Manindri is uh, out. So, on his behalf, I think Ajit is sitting here, uh, the deputy director, the IWD, and all the alumni who are there, and I see Mirza Saab here. So, thank you, sir, for coming here. And my teachers are there, so many. Professor Saxena is here, Professor Kripashankar is sitting here. And uh, Suresh Srivastava, who is also my batchmate, sort of, is here. 
I mean, with this long list of thank you, I'm, I'm uh, finding the time running short, uh, short. So please, if I miss anybody, I apologize. Thank you. And after National Anthem, I think all of us are hungry. We go for lunch. Right? Uh, please rise to the national anthem. Thank you. 